What's the difference between a law and a theory in science? That's the topic for today. Stay tuned. So you probably heard about scientific laws and scientific theories. And one of the myths that sort of floats around on these topics is the idea that a, um, that a law is sort of a theory that's been proven. I've heard this so many times, I can't tell you, but that's a complete misrepresentation of what a theory is and what a law is. So I wanted to make a quick video to try and clarify how this works. Okay, so a law in science is simply a description of something that happens. And uh, an example of this, there I can give you countless examples, but in um, I'm not a physicist, so the physicists are going to uh, tear me up for this. But um, there is a law of gravity, right, which is a description that objects that have mass attract each other in proportion to the mass, to their mass. And that means bigger objects are going to attract each other more or, uh, than smaller objects. Right? So that's just a description of what's happening. What does that tell you? Well, it, it tells you that if you do uh, if you have objects that are uh, certain masses and you put them together, they're going to attract each other. And you can create a nice, uh, neat little formula to describe it. Um, but it doesn't tell you why. It doesn't tell you why. So in order to come up with why, um, you have to have a theory of gravity. And there are a number of theories in physics, and all of them have to account for gravity. And so now you start getting into the, the realm of, oh, well, we think there's a strong force and a weak force, and uh, there's yet a third force. And so you get into all these sort of mysterious forces that we really don't understand well, at least not yet. But I'm sure physicists are making headway. Other theories have to account for the fact that uh, they may not talk about forces, and they might talk about vibrating strings, but they still have to somehow account for the phenomenon that objects that have mass attract each other in proportion to the mass. Another example is the law of natural selection in biology. So in biology, um, there's this uh, law that describes what happens when you have three ingredients, when you have um, variability within a population. So individuals are different from each other in the population. Heritability of those traits so um, though that variability gets passed down to offspring. Parents pass genes and therefore traits down to their offspring. So you've got heritability, variability. The third part is differential reproductive success. Some of those individuals are better at thriving in their environment than others. We see this in antibiotic resistant bacteria. If you don't take that full course of antibiotics that the doctor tells you to, I know it's real tempting once you start feeling better to throw out the rest of the pills or let them sit in a box in the closet for a few years. But you should really take them all because if you don't, what you're doing is you're letting some of those bacteria continue to reproduce the ones that didn't get uh, fully knocked out by the lower doses. And so um, that's going to they're going to pass on their genes, and that's how we get disease-resistant bacteria. Now, that doesn't tell you anything uh, about the uh, history of life on Earth. It's just a description of what happens. So in order to understand the bigger picture, you now need a theory of evolution. The law of natural selection is one of the important mechanisms by which evolution happens. But the theory of evolution is what elegantly ties all life on this planet together. In psychology, we have a number of laws as well. Uh, one that comes to mind is Thorndike's Law of Effect, which says that stimuli become associated with responses based on their outcomes. Right? So behaviors that 
are rewarded will increase in frequency, and behaviors that are not rewarded will decrease in frequency. That's the law of effect. It describes what happens, but it doesn't tell you why. So if a law is just a simple description, a theory tells you why. It's an exploration of why things happen. The law describes what happens. The theory tells you why. So theories are useful because they are the engine that drives scientific thinking. They take all of the different constructs or elements uh, that we think are important in understanding some topic, and they tie them all together, and they look at how they're related to each other. Good research is theory-driven. And what that means is you start with a theoretical explanation of what you think is going on in a given situation. So you come up with a theory, and the theory might have several pieces to it. Let's say I'm interested in how attitudes lead to behavior. So one of the things I might think is that people with a positive attitude uh, towards recycling might be more likely to engage in recycling behavior. But that might not be the only thing that drives their behavior. Maybe there's another element to, that I could include in my theory. So maybe um, I could include social norms. Right? So maybe if recycling is not a popular thing to do and you're gonna get mocked for doing it, then you're not gonna recycle. Conversely, if you are in an environment where uh, the recycling is really promoted and lauded, then you're going to be more likely to recycle. I can add another element. Maybe you don't feel like you have control over whether you can recycle or not. Maybe your city doesn't give you a recycling bin. And so you think, well, I can't recycle because I don't have a bin to, to uh, put it in. Well, the reality might be that you do have control and you can go and you know save up your recycling and just take it down the road to the recycling center. Or it might be that you don't have actual control. But the important thing is, whether you have actual control or not, if you don't perceive that you have control, then you won't be able to do it. And so uh, I've got a theory here with three elements. I say um, my intention to do a behavior is going to be driven by my attitude towards the behavior, the social norms of the behavior, and whether or not I think I have control over it. And that's going to help me form an intention to perform a behavior, which then presumably leads to the actual performance of the behavior. Okay, so now I've got a theory with several elements. Now I can start testing those elements. I can measure all of these things. I can measure, I could ask people, how do you feel about recycling? I could ask them, do you think recycling is a good thing for other people to do? So I could start to get social norms. I could look at, do they feel like they have control? And answer questions like, I am able to recycle if I want to. And so I could take measurements of a whole bunch of different people, and I could start looking at whether or not these things predict behavior. I could do manipulations where I hold some of these things constant, but I try to uh, give people more control, or I try to change the social norms. Right? So let's use our theory to create a testable hypothesis. I'm going to worry about the, um, the social norm piece. So whatever their attitudes are towards recycling, I'm going to measure those, but I'm not going to change them uh, in this experiment. And whether they're perceived control, I'm not going to manipulate. But I'm going to try to increase the messaging. So I'm going to take one group and I'm going to just kind of treat them as normal. That's going to be my control group. In the other group, I'm going to have them watch some videos of their neighbors, their next door neighbors uh, going out, the people that live in the same area, same neighborhood, same building, I'm going to have, video, have them watch videos of them going out and recycling and talking to each other about, you know, interview them as they bring their recycling out to the curb and talk about how cool it is and, uh, you know, kind of relate to each other about why they think it's important and this kind of thing. So then 
I'm going to measure, once they've watched this video, um, I'm going to measure whether or not they have an intention to increase their recycling. And what do I predict? I predict the group that, um, that got the video will uh, recycle, intend to recycle more than the group that didn't get the video. Right? So I've used my theory, and now I'm going to test a piece of that theory. I'm going to test one of the constructs of that theory by creating a hypothesis that I can then test. So now I can carry out the experiment. Okay, I, one result that could happen is that I could just get no difference between the groups. Another uh, outcome that I could have is that uh, my recycling propaganda had the opposite effect, where now instead of, instead of encouraging recycling, maybe it actually discourages recycling. I hope that's not the case, but it could be. Or I will have the anticipated result, which is that they will start recycling more, or at least have more intentions to recycle than the group that I didn't uh, intervene with. So let's say that I find out, I do the experiment, and it turns out that my prediction came true, that people who were exposed to a video that promoted a social norm of, around recycling tended to recycle more. Okay, what happened to my theory? Did it get stronger or did it get weaker? Duh, it gets stronger, right? Because now I have demonstrated that that part of the theory seems to be true. Now let me ask you a tricky question. What would happen if there was no difference between the groups? Does my theory then get stronger or weaker? Well, I, this is a trick question because this is the beauty of science. This is how science works. This is why it is the single best way we have of uh, gaining knowledge that is reliable. When my data doesn't support the theory, what happens? I don't just toss the entire theory out. I change it. I modify it. I've learned something new. And I can now incorporate that new knowledge into the theory. So I can modify my theory, change things around. And I can then produce new hypotheses, which I can then test based on the theory. And over time, over time, through this process of revision and testing, that theory will get stronger and stronger and stronger. The theory never gets weaker because you take the weak parts and you cut them away. You get rid of them. You toss that bit out. So the theory is going to get stronger and stronger and stronger over time. And it doesn't matter what the outcome of the experiment is. So the theory is the tool that allows you to create these predictions and generate this engine of experimentation to help you develop a better and better understanding of a topic. What are the chances that you got the theory exactly right the first time? I mean, that never happens. That would be mind-blowing. But what about if you've had a few runs at it and you've learned something, you've learned a little more, and you've learned a little more? That theory is going to be dialing in right onto a more and more accurate representation of what's actually going on. And so your theory is going to be getting less wrong over time. So in that way, the more tried and tested a theory is, the better it is. So for example, I have a lot of biologist friends who, when they talk about evolution, they get very defensive about my definition of a theory because they say, no, a theory has been tested uh, and is, you know, is, is heavily supported. And I think I know why you're saying that, because a lot of people use this language about, oh, it's just a theory when talking about evolution, which is the unifying principle in biology. It's unfortunate that uh, people don't understand how important theories are. But I could come up with a brand new theory right now with no empirical support for it, and it would still be a theory because it accomplishes this goal of creating experiments and testable hypotheses, and I can start going through the process. But if you've got a theory like the theory of evolution, which has been around now for uh, basically a couple hundred years, 
That theory has been tested and tested and tested and has gained so much support and now has uh, so much overwhelming evidence. And the theory has been changed and we've added to it and we've grown it to help understand all these different processes. Not, it's not just natural selection that's driving evolution. There are other processes, evolutionary processes that shape change over time in populations. And, and so these kinds of things, we, we've grown and changed and uh, adjusted the theories to, to better understand these things. So of course, evolution is just a theory. It's, it's not the theory part I worry about, it's the just a, <laughs> because that is a, a complete underselling of what a theory is and what it does. Ultimately, this is the strength of the scientific method. The idea that you can take a theory, and, which is your understanding of a topic and all the little elements that go to that topic, and start systematically testing them and make adjustments to your understanding as that data comes in. That's how science works. And when people think about scientific laws, they are really misunderstanding that the laws to me are kind of boring. They're just a description of what's happening. Ugh, who wants that? No, the action is there in the theories. That's where you really learn something new. That's where you really gain an understanding of why. Why does this happen? Okay. With that said, <laughs> I hope this video has helped you sort of disentangle the idea of a law, a theory, a hypothesis, theoretical constructs or the pieces of the theory and how they sort of work together to generate scientific knowledge. Okay, I'll have more videos on this topic coming up, so if you wanna experience those, you can like, hit subscribe, click the bell, all that good stuff. And until then, I will see you next time. Bye-bye. Recycling, another thing to feel guilty about. I either have to walk around with a guilt or a pocket full of tinfoil.